CSS Grid is pretty exciting. But to me, what's exciting isn't just the code. It's what we're going to do with this code. It's going to be how this changes graphic design forever on the web. And in order to really dig into that and figure out what is going on, I've been doing a lot of studies, a lot of experiments, and I wanted to show you one of them. I took a Mondrian painting and made it into a responsive website. So this is a Mondrian painting. There are many of them, of course. Uh, Pete Mondrian did many over and over and over and over again. Really, he was doing a study of what does it mean to have a bunch of boxes on a grid? What happens if you do it like this? What happens if you do it like that? What happens if you have a giant red one that's bigger than the others and there's kind of this diagonal line with this blue box? What does that feel like? It's funny, these Mondrian paintings, these are the kinds of paintings that people go to a modern art museum and they see them and they go home thinking, I could draw that. What's the big deal about that? I don't understand why that's worth X bazillion dollars. Um, it helps to understand this Mondrian painting in context. So what was going on graphic design wise in the rest of the world when Pete Mondrian showed up and started doing this kind of work and other modernists? Well, a lot of it was, uh, Victorian graphic design. And Victorian graphic design had lots and lots of like ornamentation and heavily decorated and also extremely symmetrical. Everything was symmetrical. And on the web today, we don't, we're not really into this kind of ornamentation. We used to be more ornamented. We've gotten on you know, flat design, kind of getting rid of ornamentation in much the way the modernists kind of got rid of the orient or ornamentation of the Victorians. But the thing that we continue to do that the Victorians did is make everything completely symmetrical. You could take most websites today and fold them in half and they would be the same on each half of that fold. But there's not really a reason that we have to do it this way. We could easily start to do asymmetrical designs and break out of this totally symmetrical thing. And I see these Mondrian paintings and I'm like, what would it be? You know, what if there's like a, a landing page for a lot of content on something like the New York Times homepage or some other kind of such website where uh, the layout was done in more of a Mondrian shape rather than in a kind of the symmetrical shapes that we keep using today. Um, so I wanted to do this as a web page. The first thing to decide is how do I represent this in HTML? And this is what I came up with. So I thought about making all of those different colors be background colors, or I thought about using CSS to create the color. And I ended up deciding that I really wanted to keep the brush strokes from the original painting. So I took the painting and I chopped it up into pieces. Um, and I didn't make them background images. I made them foreground images. I made them content images. Because I feel like if you look at this painting, you're thinking, what is it? What's the content that's here? What's the interface that's here? What is it that I need to convey to my users? What is it that the browser needs to see or the search engine or the screen reader? Or how do I give something to all of those different things? I don't want to do this in 100% CSS. So by giving uh, HTML images and doing a bunch of separate images, that to me is the best way to represent this painting. And then it gives me the opportunity to put alt text on every single one of those images so that if someone is using a screen reader, for instance, the experience that they have is this poem, white, white, yellow, white, white, red, yellow, white, 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 black, white, white, yellow. Like that, it makes me laugh. I find that hilarious. And I'm like, yes, that is this experience. If you were to hear it, that would be a good way to hear this painting. Okay, good. All right, we got that HTML. It's important to me to always lock down the HTML first. Make the HTML be what it is, the essence of the content or of the interface, the essence of what it is we need to convey. Then add CSS to figure out the styling. So I added a little bit of CSS to make the black lines are all in CSS. And here I've done a super basic layout just so that you can see all of these separate images in a flow layout before I've applied grid. This is what you get. This is kind of the flow layout version of it. And then I've applied CSS grid to it. And you can see here, I've got a responsive Mondrian painting. The blocks of color are actually rearranging themselves at different widths of the viewport to reconfigure into a different kind of Mondrian painting, right? I don't have any media queries in this code. 
CSS Grid lets us do a layout like this with much less code than you would need in order to do this with something like a float. So let's look at the code. That list, if you remember the HTML, I had an unordered list and a bunch of list items. So the unordered list is going to become our grid container, and the list items are each going to be grid items. So the first thing we want to do is define our grid on the grid container, in this case the UL, and then we're going to add a little bit of code to some of the LIs in order to uh, do some specific stuff I'll show you in a minute to each of the items. But first looking at the grid, on the UL we put display grid, grid template columns, grid auto rows, and grid auto flow. So grid template columns is going to define the columns on our grid. And here I've defined them as repeat auto fit min max 80 pixels to 1FR. I have another video where I explain in detail how and why that piece of syntax works, so I'm not going to do that here. But in general, this repeat auto fit min max 80 to, pixels to 1FR is telling the browser, I would like you to make a bunch of columns. I'm not going to tell you how many to make. You decide how many to make. I want each of the columns to be a minimum of 80 pixels and a maximum of 1FR. 80 pixels then is the minimum. So the moment that there's space to have another 80 pixel column, it adds another column. Or the moment that there's not enough space to have 80 pixel columns, it subtracts a column. That's why we don't need any media queries. The browser is deciding how many columns to make based on this min-max syntax. And then the 1FR is saying, hey, don't just stay at 80. I do want you to grow and be flexible. And I want each of those columns to have the same as everything else. One fraction, one fraction, one fraction, one fraction. You're all going to be the same as each other. So that's all we need. We don't need any media queries. We don't have to change the number of columns. This one line of text is going to make these columns range from 80 pixels to whatever it is right before there's room for another 80 pixel column. Grid auto rows is defining our rows. If we did nothing, it would automatically make rows, but they'd be all kinds of different heights, and I'm not really sure, I don't remember what I did at first, how it works out, but by saying grid auto rows 80, we're basically saying, you automatically figure out how many rows to make. make when you do make a row, make it 80 pixels. So the rows are always 80 pixels tall. And grid auto flow dense is another bit of code that makes this work part of the magic that we need to get this responsive Mondrian painting. I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. But here on the UL we've defined our grid. Then we're going to, on not all, but many of the list items, we're going to give them dimensions. We're going to tell them how wide to be, or we're going to tell them how tall to be. What we're not doing is telling them where to go on the grid. We're just going to let the auto placement algorithm place everything and replace, move things around, change the placement of things as the number of columns changes. But we do need to tell the browser how big to make each of these items. So here in this code you can see that the fourth item is getting a grid row of span 6. The fifth item is getting a grid row of span 2. The sixth item is getting grid column span 4, grid row span 4. The span with a number is basically saying I want you to span this many rows or this many columns. This diagram is of a different kind of example but it's, it, it does the similar pr principle I wanted to show you. So here Item 1 and 2 are simply um, the size of one cell. By default, if you don't tell the browser, I want this particular item to be bigger, or I want it to span, if you don't tell it, I want it this to span, it will automatically take that content, however big that content is, and put it into one cell, one by one. So the first one, the second one, or each one by one. The third one, I'm saying grid column span 2, and so now it spans two columns. The fourth one I've said grid column span two, so it spans two columns, and I've said grid row span two, and it spans two rows, which is why it's bigger. You'll also see in this diagram, this is an illustration of what happens when you're not using grid auto flow dense, when by default you end up with a sparse state, where it's just grid auto flow, or in this case grid auto flow rows, which means I want you to pour the content into row by row by row by default, and also if you say grid auto flow row, it's just going to go row by row, and it's going to do it in this sparse kind of way. So it's taken the first item and put it in the first cell, the second item in the second cell, it put the third item in the third cell, and it would put the fourth item in that fourth, well now the fifth, in the upper right hand corner, but Four, number four doesn't fit into that little white space in the corner, so it's going to skip that space and go down on the next row, make a new row, start it on the next row, put number four there, then five, six, seven, 
8, 9, 10, 11, right? So anytime it can put, like it takes number five and it puts number five after number four. It doesn't put it back up in that space. So it's just gonna go in the order of the, the numbers in this case, but what this is is the order in the HTML. So it follows the order in the HTML. It puts each item into a space. If there's not enough space, it just skips it and puts it in the next space. So you can end up with these empty spaces. If we apply grid autoflow dense, the browser will actually rearrange the order of the content. It will start by using the source order in the HTML, but in this case, it puts number four into a big, the bigger space that it needs, and then it gets to number five, and it says, hmm, you know, number five will fit in that upper right-hand corner. I'm just gonna go ahead and backfill it. I'm gonna take that number five and stick it up in that corner. So in that way, you end up with this dense layout where things slightly rearrange themselves. The order gets rearranged in order to fill in as many gaps as possible. Here's another example you can see where I have a bunch of photographs and I've put numbers on these photos and you can see that they're not in fact completely in the number order, in the source order, in the HTML. They've rearranged themselves in order to make this dense layout. And you can see I'm using the same principle of um, the repeat autofill min-max syntax to change the number of columns based on the size of the viewport and the photos rearrange themselves and make themselves dense into a dense layout. It's, it's a, an amazing way to do a kind of layout. So back to our Mondrian painting, uh, here's the code again. Uh, on the UL I've defined the grid and on the list items I've defined the size. I've said grid autoflow dense to get us that dense packing and that's it. I didn't tell the list items where to go and this is the result those color blocks will rearrange themselves in order to create the densest layout that they can and the number of columns changes based on the amount of space that's available. You can go to my website labs.gensims.com and check it out. I have a couple different variations. I'm messing around with uh, what would it means to make it so that the size of the rectangle doesn't change. What, what kind of code do I need in order to maintain the aspect ratio of each one of those blocks? I'm still experimenting, trying to see what is it that I could do to most authentically represent this Mondrian painting. And not because I care about this Mondrian painting, but because it's an opportunity to really learn something about grid. I learn a lot doing these experiments, even though they're completely unpractical, impractical, um, they're still interesting and I learned things about grid that I find pretty surprising. I think this is my favorite one, this diamond Mondrian where I'm using clip path to clip the rest of the painting. And I think about Pete Mondrian and all the many, many, many paintings that he did in order to experiment with what does it feel like, what does it look like to have different kinds of lines and different kinds of shapes and different blocks of color. Here we are using a computer to explore some of the same questions uh, and get many, many, many variations very, very, very quickly. So I hope you enjoy, check it out, dig into the code yourself and see how it is you might use these kinds of principles in a situation that's much more practical.